here in New York. It's it's also super beautiful right now. Okay, we have we have some people coming in and um Tonight we're going to do a, a talk. I'm going to be asking questions to Cisco Bradley, the author of William Parker's biography, and we're so honored to have both him and visionary basis, visionary all around William Parker with us tonight. And we're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about William Parker's career, his life, his ideas. And then for students that would like to continue with us, we're going to have a master class hosted by William Parker directly following our talk. So feel free to stick around for that tonight. So people are, are coming in. Uh, let's see here. And I think I'll just go ahead and, and start with just sharing a little information about the book. Since ascending onto the world stage in the 1990s as one of the premier bassists and composers of his generation, William Parker has perpetually toured around the world and released over 40 albums as a leader. He's one of the most influential jazz artists alive today. In Universal Tonality, historian and critic Cisco Bradley tells the story of Parker's life and music. Drawing on interviews with Parker and his collaborators, Bradley traces Parker's ancestral roots in West Africa via the Carolinas to his childhood in the South Bronx and illustrates his rise from the 1970s jazz lofts and extended work with pianist Cecil Taylor to the present day. He outlines how Parker's early influences, Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, Albert Eiler, and writers of the Black Arts Movement grounded Parker's aesthetic and music practice in a commitment to community and the struggle for justice and freedom. Throughout, Bradley foregrounds Parker's understanding of music, the role of the artist, the relationship between art, politics, and social transformation. Intimate and capitious, universal tonality is the definitive work on Parker's life and music. I'm happy to have my copy, and I am really enjoying this read. Thank you all for being here tonight. And um, it's also exciting for me just because of knowing you, both of you all, for some years. And William Parker, you've been a great inspiration to me. It's an honor to be able to have this conversation with you. And, um, you know, one of, one of your longtime, lifelong collaborators is one of my favorite and longest mentors, Hami Drake. So... <laughs> So like I said, I'm just uh, really excited to have you all here tonight. First of all, like when I started reading the book, I thought it was so great that I think it's really challenging and daunting, I'm sure for you, Cisco, to write about someone that you have a relationship with, someone that you interact with, someone that you've listened to for for decades, and now to take on this job to create the authoritative <laughs> biography, that I'm sure was really daunting. And um, I know, William, I know that you were probably really gracious, but one thing that you all agreed to do was to meet regularly. And I know that that's not always the case with writers having that opportunity to connect so often with the person that they're that they're doing the research on and to like have this collaboration um, in the project so can you all share maybe Cisco and and William can you both share what that experience has been like for you how it kind of came about how the idea came about for the book and William were you like originally into this idea or was it something that had to grow on you how did this come about you want to go first cisco sure i i can yeah um kick us thank, off thank you nicole and thank, thank you william um 
Uh, you know, I think and that's a big question. I think the, you know, I was, yeah, you know, I started listening to Williams music around 2005. So, you know, I, I came to it much later than a lot of people I'm sure that have known William for decades. So, uh, but, you know, I, the first record I heard of his was Sound Unity, which I still think is one of my favorite of his records. Um, you know, but I started listening to other stuff. I just kind of became obsessed with it and started listening to music by other people in the scene in New York. And at the time I was living in, in Madison, Wisconsin as a graduate student. So I had no real relationship with the music as a lot, you know, as like a living thing. It's a live thing. And I um, just happened to get a, a job teaching in New York City after I graduated. And I started going to see William play, uh, right, you know, William plays so much much in New York that I, I had the opportunity to see him play many dozens of times over the first few years I was in New York, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, around that time. So, you know, to me, I never thought even then that I'd be writing a book about, about William Parker. So that all kind of came later. I, um, I and mean, I had a huge, his music always spoke to me. So I, I just kind of, I, I was re-enchanted by it. Um, but, you know, I, didn't know then I that you know I, I guess I wanted to make sure I had something meaningful to say and in a way of approaching it that would that would uh, do more good than harm or something you know, in terms of how, uh, understanding somebody's work as an artist um, and then in twenty what twenty fifteen I approached him uh, and I you know I didn't think I, I don't know I, I didn't know. How, how how William might respond, and I, I just kind of put it out there in an email, and he wrote back, and it, we actually moved forward fairly quickly. We had known each other a little bit. I'd interviewed him once before, just for for Jazz Right Now, for the, the website that I run, and we, I'd published an article there. And I think that initial article that I did uh, about William's work really kind of made me realize like how much how much thinking that he's he's doing in the music in terms of how deep it goes into his own kind of understanding of the world into his own kind of cosmology. And, um, and I think that sort of the deep uh, kind of intellectual uh, aspects of how he thinks, I think about the world and about, um, about the music. So um, when I approached him and we kind of moved fairly quickly, I, I will say, I think, I don't think we value culture very much in the United States and not in the ways that we should. And I'm always kind of amazed at, at the extraordinary artists that we don't write about while they're doing their work. And really, I mean, William's been working at such a high level, I mean, for a long, long time, but I mean, he's been so prolific, especially in the, in the past, I don't know, you know, 20, 30 years, but you know, it seems like he's accelerating, right? You know, at, at this point, um, I think of extraordinary artists that, you know, where's, uh, William's heard me say this a whole bunch of times, where's the book on Cecil Taylor? Where's, you know, we could make a long list of extraordinary artists that haven't been written about. Um, so to me, it was a real honor to be able to do this. You know, well, William's very much, very, very active really doing his work because I think it's a different kind of book. Um, I wouldn't have been able to write it this way if I didn't know him, if I didn't, I wasn't able to say, you know, call him and say, you know, I need to, I, I want you to clarify something that you said or, or, you know, that kind of thing. So we conducted 21 interviews over the span of about three years. So. You know, it was wow, it was an in depth project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the last interviews were literally like a couple weeks before I submitted the manuscript. So, um, and some of those were on the phone by that point, where I was just like trying to clarify final details. But to me, it was a, I mean, it's, it's, it's the it's the, real, it's the greatest honor of my professional life to have been involved in this project. And um, you know, so many of the words in, in the book are Williams, and so you know, in some ways, I feel like it was really a collaboration. Yeah, you know, so. Um, yeah, and then in terms of being feeling daunted, I, I guess uh, maybe I'm foolish enough to try to uh, I sort of jump into projects before I think about the what anxieties I might have or what you know how I might fail at it or something. So you know I, I have that tendency, but I um, I appreciated William's confidence, and I feel like he always spoke very directly and very plainly to me in terms of like you know how he felt about things, and I feel like we had a very open you know relationship in terms of just. You know, communication. So that I felt like really moved the project forward in a, in a, in a way that it might not have otherwise.
So, so Willem, do you want to turn yeah, to you? Yes. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, what we're dealing with here is inspiration. Okay. We all kind of live our lives and uh, people go to work and they're constantly, but inside you're living your life and that has to be supported. I mean, that's the reason we have art. That's the reason we have beautiful things around us so that we can be inspired to have confidence, to trust ourselves, to look deeply into ourselves. And this music, what um, the AACM might call great black music is very rich. Every person in this music, and and this is, you know, Chicago or New York. I mean, you ever, you ever talk to Leroy Jenkins? I mean, <laughs> yeah, he was my the first ACM person I met. Luckily, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, and then you, and then like, you know, Cala Perusha. I mean, I, like uh, the last three years of his life, I was his like um, valet and keep and helped him out. And so these, you know, and then Billy Bang and and and, and uh, well, Muhal Richard Abrams, Cecil Taylor, Sun Ra, Jimmy Lyons, Milford Graves, Sonny Murray. And this is just a smidgen. All of these people have can be great inspirations through their music, and they all have a different story to tell. And those different stories can relate to someone living in Pittsburgh, maybe that's saying, oh, I'm odd. I, you know, I hear music this way. And then because they've never heard them, they've never heard, you know, Steve McCall or Sonny Murray or uh, Roscoe Mitchell. And then when they hear them, they say, well, wow, I'm not odd. I, 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 they're playing beautiful music, so I must be beautiful too. So everybody should have a book written about them because we all need inspiration. Now, those who are lucky enough to have a book written about them. I mean, when Cisco came to me with the idea, I mean, I thought it was a great idea because I, I knew it's almost like if, if certain people's story is not told, they'll just slip through the cracks and then history will, will wipe that's, it over. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, like a guy like uh, like Fred Anderson. Yes. Okay, you know, uh, have this book, these books called Conversations with uh, Interviews with Musicians and Fred's in there. And the philosophy behind that was to get people I knew were gonna slip. When they talk about the great tenors, they're not gonna mention Fred Anderson. He's gonna slip through the cracks. So we ha as historians have to make sure that people like Fred Anderson do not slip through the cracks, that their story is told and their presence is made known. Not just, um, I'm not gonna name any names, not just what you, you know, the tenors who they put out there, the musicians they put out there. So everyone has a wonderful story. So um, when Cisco came with the project, I was gonna say, no, I couldn't say no. I said, you know, because I said, yes, let's do it. And we interviewed and, uh, you know, the unleashing of the, the story. And then even when you read the story, it's only part of the story. Right. You know, it's only part of this. It's not the whole story because, you know, and that's why I always tell musicians, you know, you have to, someone writes a book about you, then you have to write your own book and then yes. another book. Yes. Because especially if you're still alive, because, you know, you, you can really tell the story and who can more tell the story than the people who are alive participating. So I thought it was a wonderful idea. And, um, and the, the, just the, and also, you know, the fact that he did it a little differently. He went back to the ancestry yes. of my um, um, family. Origins. Yeah, yes. the origins, you know, which was um, very interesting. I'm still learning about, you know, my father's side of the family because yeah. you know, I, I didn't know anything about that. So I. So, yeah, that was a fascinating way for the book to begin because as African Americans, there's all there's so much mystery in going to your roots. 
And and for Cisco, for you to start out the book by doing that research, you know, and you talk about uh, William's ancestry uh, coming from along the coast of the West and Central Africa, stretching from what is now Senegal to the Congo, and then going into detail about that. That was something that I've never really seen in a musician biography. Uh, and it was, it kind of is a new structure that I think hopefully will, you know, perpetuate itself. Because I think we need that. And we do have more resources now to learn more of those details. It does take a lot of work to do it. But, but I really appreciated you not just starting out like, William was born here and you know what I'm saying but like really going to to connect those cultural uh lineages you know what I'm saying uh the, the yeah. because that's something that that's a legacy that goes be that goes for generations and generations and that was a beautiful unfolding uh that you had there and and the detail with the map and all of that I really I really appreciated that. And it's especially was deep for me to be reading about Virginia and North Carolina. And I'm sitting in North Carolina while I'm reading it. You know, my my family, my mother's family is from Virginia, really close to North Carolina. So I'm not far from where my family, origin, you know, like from the United States started out, but to be there while I'm reading it was really exciting for me. Um, William, this is a question I've always wanted to talk to you about, and that is uh, the tone world. Mm -hmm. Because this is something like that I, like there's some things that are in your language and your words that you use that I completely 110% relate to and the tone world is one of them like I always believed that the music was another dimension where we could have like for myself my my as a child the music held a space for me where I could be safe and where where I could not only experience things but put things that would not like where I where I would not be damaged or like be a target of violence, but where I could have freedom in a space where I wasn't having it in the 3D reality. And, uh, you know, you have some some of your lyrics in your you have a new box set as well. Migration of silence in and out of the tone world. And one of the phrases that comes out of that that really touched me was that the highest form of an intellect is acceptance of the unknown. And if you could just share a little bit with our audience about that. Well, you know, the idea of the tone world came to me, uh, I think it was playing at Rashid Ali's place uh, 1977 or so. Um, and, uh, and um, it came time for me to solo. And I really, I picked the bass up like a saxophone and was playing my bass, my half size bass above my head. And I really began to see these colors and I left the bandstand. And I went to this, I mean, I came back, when I came back, I said I was in the tone world. And it was a world that I repeatedly wanted to go into. Uh, every time I played, you know, I wanted to go there and because it was a place when we go uplift ourselves from ourselves and we go to a different dimension, uh, it's like being in love, you know, deeply in love. Um, and we're in a place where we, we feel safe. We feel um, no pain, no struggle. We just feel this constant flow of, of beauty and inspiration all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So it's like, wow, wow, we can get there every, you know, every time we play and, and you could be, you could say, okay, I'm a painter. So where do I go? Well, you go to the, you go to the world of light and shape. You say, well, I'm a writer. Well, where do I go? What's the tone world for writers? It's, it's the world of poetry, the world of imagination. It's all about imagination and, and getting into these, this place, feeding yourself, getting a big meal of inspiration, you know, to where you're stuffed. And then you come back and then you learn something about how to live. And you learn something that it's not about solving the mysteries. It's about accepting the mystery through acceptance of the mystery piece. That's a quote from Kenneth Patchen, the poet, but it's also the name of my first album, through acceptance of the mystery piece. And so it's not about owning. You see, people think that life is about owning things and possessing things, but and about knowing things. But you know, um, my um, one of my base teachers, I studied with Wilbur Ware, and Wilbur would always say, "I, I, I said, um, Wilbur, uh, do you know anything about music?" And he'd say to me. What's music? And then he'd go play something brilliant. And, <laughs> and then, you know, so he, he was saying that, that you don't have to know anything. You just, you know, does the flower know how to grow? Does the sun know how to rise? You know, does the water know how to flow? Let's cap, let's take the water and let's talk to a, <laughs> let's, talk, <laughs> let's, let's talk to a glass of water and see, if, all right, how do you do this? You know, you, you can't, it's, 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 it's connected with nature. You just know these things. Yeah. And that's how you want to get with, with music mm-hmm. um, to just accept what you don't know and, and say, that's where the beauty is. That's where the perfection is because what we, every time we know something, it, it's kind of like it's spoiled in a way, you know, <laughs> you know, and we want to possess it, but it's like, wow, to, 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 to live a life where you don't, you know, where you just, well, well, what are we going to play? Uh, I don't know. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why and it's so strong when you, when you do it, you know, I was at, um, I was in Italy and, um, you know, I did a, at opposite Anthony Braxton, and so he had played with his regular group. And then the promoter said, you know, Don Moyer was there. He said, why don't y'all do a trio? And uh, so we did a trio because he felt that he needed to get to just play. And everybody was so happy and enlightened after we, after we just played that trio. I mean, everybody needs that because that's kind of maybe our, our takeoff pad for everybody going into to where it just happens and they don't expect it. And then when you try to make it happen again, it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And say, well, well, how do you make how it happen? How do you happen? get there? <laughs> you don't make it happen. You know, you just, you know, it's, it's just relax, you know, right. and that, and that's the hardest thing for, you know, for people to understand. But so, uh, so I said, well, I got to keep talking about the tone world because it's, it's, it's really like the foundation to, to everything I'm, I'm trying to talk about, which is just inspiration and imagination mm-hmm. and um, and poem and poetry. Yes, because imagination is just so central for our survival. And it's also so key for finding alternative reality to, you know, a lot of these things going on. And you've you've really been a champion of, of of imagination through your the energy of the music and and the collaborations the poetry uh your work with the vision festival with patricia nicholson parker and and um you know you're always uplifting others as well like you're always you know like you talked about the the interviews you did for rogue art for that for those books that you did and it's really a, such an inspiration. Um, one of the other terms that you that that came out of your box set that really spoke to me was that 
improvisation is another word word for love, you know. Um, and and I know that you know improvisation. We're all doing it, but I if you wouldn't mind just sharing your thoughts about what it means to you because I know for you like it has a special special purpose and and practice you know um well um improvisation is you know has been defined many ways you know um up in Canada, they got those grants to write all those books on improvisation and to do a lot of studies. You know, you write articles and this and that. And, and, but basically, um, it's not so much about people say, well, making music on the spot. It's about um, being present at the moment to allow music to flow through you and then allowing it to take you where it wants to go and believing that the idea okay well that that we didn't invent music that music was here when human beings got here and what we do is we the same as the mountains and the trees there's music and so what we do is we participate in this ritual and um and we know, we don't have to, and you know, it's already in, we just flow with this flow and it will tell you where to go. It's autodidactic and in, in the, in the long run that you, you know, whatever school or whatever you go to, you're teaching, it's teaching you, you're flowing with it. So improvisation is all about being one with the universe, you know, because it's, it's about finding your place with the with the trees I, you know in the soil you mentioned the soil before turning the soil over finding your place you know with how we're supposed to live and it's not about you know well what we're supposed to be on wall street no you're supposed to be making money no you you know you you don't you don't see trees going to trees don't need money mountains don't need money. the wind ah the wind that's another one we forget you know, so 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 there's these things. If if the image, one of the first images that came to me, if you put a drum set in a tree, and and let and have the wind blow over the tree, and the branches were the were the were the arms of a drummer, what would the drum sound like? Oh, they wouldn't sound like. I said, yeah, they, 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 it would sound more like what 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 Brother Steve McCall was doing last night. I said, yeah, that's what it would sound like. And then I said, well, you know, if you put a saxophone in the same tree and had the wind blow through it, you know something? I don't think it would sound like bebop. <laughs> <laughs> it would sound like what these guys over here are doing with the dip, 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 the little sounds, the the the, the, the birds, yeah. So that's all part of nature and it's all part of improvisation, but it's also, sorry to be long winded, but you have to find out where you come from and what you're supposed to be doing because there are all kinds of, of you know, the, the blue jays do this, the, the roses do this, the, 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 the swans do this, the pelicans do this. Who are you? What are you supposed to be doing? And you don't have to do everything. And that and that's the beautiful thing about music and improvisation is you know you can play one sound. That's all you have to do is play one sound. If you say I play, we talked talking to Joe McPhee about this yesterday. If you play one sound every day, you get up in the morning and play that one sound. After about ten years, you'll be the greatest player of that one sound in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and then when oh man, when I got. His headphones are popping out. Hold on. <laughs> so then when you do a concert and people come to you and there's thousands of people in the audience and they say, what's this guy going to do? Yeah, I want to hear this guy play. He's going to play one sound, you know, and then you play your one sound and they're like, wow, woo, that knocked me out. Right. You know, 
That was just like the rain drenching me. So, you know, so there's all kinds of ways of looking at it. But the main thing is that all there's no one way better than the other way. And we all have to, you know, play what we play, what we hear, what we feel. And everyone should, you know, should do that. But it's, but it's all about, as we just said before, you know, vision, improvisation, imagination, and the poetry in all of this. Speaking of poetry, I want to read this quote that uh, Cisco put in chapter nine. The, the chapter is called Toward a Universal Sound, William Parker Quartet and Raining on the Moon. And the quote is, art is the blood of the people, whether they are aware of it or not. It is still the role of the musician to incite revolution spiritual and human change. If your art is doing what it's supposed to do, you should be on the most wanted list. <laughs> and the times we're living in, it seems like it's only been intensifying from when you probably wrote that quote. Um, and I don't know if maybe, Cisco, if you wanna share what were some of the challenges that you had in in uh, expressing Williams' philosophy and also the, his essence, like for his essence to shine through the work? You know, that's probably the biggest challenge for an author. You know, and of course, having you know the having that opportunity that you had to be able to include William's words, I'm sure helped a lot, but what were some of the other ways that you, you know, were able to do that? Because I know that's not easy to do, but I think you did it really well. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I think there were, I mean, I think there were, I think there were quite a few challenges. I think the, I mean, to say, when you're represent when you're writing a book about somebody else you know you, and you don't you i think the biggest challenge is, is the potential for misrepresentation or distortion so i'm um, talking about an, uh, you know the, uh, philosophies uh, essences of you know, theories william has many and it's very rich and deep so that is i think not to um exaggerate not to diminish not to distort so i think all of that to me was probably the biggest town. I mean, not that I was consciously looking to distort or any of that, but subconsciously or unknowingly. And I think that happens all the time with writers. So, um, you know, the, the, you know, trying to make sure that you're being true to the person. So to me, that I think was something that I thought about a lot as I was writing. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I, you know, I might as well just go out, you know, sort of speak to this very directly. I mean, I, you know, as a white writer, I think I, I thought a lot about what, try, I'm trying to make sure that I wasn't doing that, you know, wasn't misrepresenting William in ways, you know, uh, that I think a lot of white writers do. You see it in music criticism all the time. You see it in scholarly writing as well, um, fictional writing even. So... Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you do that in an appropriate way? Um, right. And, how do you, you know, not yeah. just over romanticize, right. but to really try to be as authentic as you can. Um, yeah. and I'm sure I, like, I mean, I should there say that any times where William was like, no, man, you don't got it. This ain't, this ain't it right here. Did that ever happen? William? Well, I, I was going on <laughs> trust. <laughs> a lot because the thing is this for Cisco to come up with this idea I thought I figured it was inspirational and sometimes uh -huh. when somebody comes up with an idea because no one has come up with an idea before I mean there's a book about me that's written in Italian mm. uh, I, I don't I've never read it because I don't speak Italian but um, but it, he said he had an idea for a book and he wrote it and um, so I uh, just want to make sure that um, we might have, you know, 
made a few little corrections here um and um but not that many right we have we didn't really uh, hash out a lot of things did we no not really i had i did have i mean i gave the entire manuscript to william kind of as i was writing it and he would kind of you know come back with comments didn't have a ton i yeah you know i think um i i feel like you know william's first of all i should say william's maybe the most quotable person i've ever met or I had you know, gotten to know him on a deeper <laughs> level. <laughs> so I, I, when I was writing the book, I found that I was quoting a lot. And when I, you know, the way that the publishers were, because I send this off to the publisher, they actually sent it out to, I think it was three peer reviewers. They gave comments and though they brought those back. And one of the, one of the, outs, one of the peer reviewers actually said, um, you know, that, that I had placed William's voice so centrally central to the narrative that my authorial voice, like my voice as the author, was actually sort of being diminished. And I actually took that, and I think they're encouraging me to strengthen my 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 position in the narrative. I I took that as a as a good sign in a way because I felt like I had really worked hard to make sure that he his voice was the driving voice in the narrative. I didn't want to okay. really overshadow it or distort it or undermine it with. Especially, I think, just in the way that it's written, uh, I thought that would work. The other thing I should say is I think, you know, I mean, I felt like, um, you know, even, even some of the unquoted parts, I think, are certainly, like, steeped in his language in a way, because I think I was paraphrasing his language into work. I should also say, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I delved deeply into, uh, I tried to employ his lyrics at times and and poetry that he had written that I thought sometimes could take a big idea and sometimes present it in a kind of a concise and very um, potent format you know as opposed to some sort of long-winded explanation I also generally tried to present his words and not feel like I always had to like somehow have to explain them as an as the author so especially with the lyrics and the poetry I often try to just you know sort of create some kind of context, but then put it in there and just sort of let the reader digest it for themselves rather than have me explain every detail or something. I didn't think that, that wasn't really what I was looking to do. So, um, yeah. Uh, One thing that's I don't really, think there's anything else. I mean, I, yeah. One thing that's really yeah, incredible ahead, is there's, there's over a hundred pages of uh, the discography or um, it's just a really great large, like the notes and the discography for at the at the end. Yeah. Did you, Cisco? Did you do that on your own, or was that uh, how was that process? Because you had to find, er, you tried to find and uncover every single album William has been on in his entire life, which is like amazing. To have that reference in the book, just yeah. that alone is a, a big reason to get the book, so yeah. that we can find out what all you know, all the places we can listen to that. I, uh, yeah, I, I did do the discography myself, and then I think right before we were about to publish it, uh, I think William and Stephen Joe, you know, who runs uh, Alm Fidelity, uh, he said, "Oh, there's a few that you're missing." So I remember he he did add a few, <laughs> but I was like. Most most of it was my work, and then I mean the the footnotes, which are pretty extensive. Those are all mine. I, I guess you know I, I tried to follow. I tried to do deep research on you know, all the different aspects of this as I, I could. I was learning a lot too. I mean, I, I learned so much writing this book because um, I mean I, some things I knew. I mean, I you know I, okay, I, I'm I'm quite familiar with the, say the music of Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane and Albert Eiler. I didn't know who Stan Brackage really was. I think I'd heard the name. I'd never seen anything, you know, so it's, I feel like when William especially was talking about his influences, I felt like there were things I really had to delve into and really had to research in a real way. And so that, you know, that was, that was a learning process for myself. I mean, you can't go into this kind of project and expect to, to know what you need to know ahead of time. So to me, it was always like, I'd be heading off to the library, you know, with a, with a list of books or, or, or things that I, that I was trying to, to learn, so. That was, it was sort of a constant learning process for me. Yeah. Great. And I, you know, I should say there, there's something you said at the beginning. 
I know it on the back of the book that it says this is the definitive work on Parker's life and music. And I always cringe a little bit when I see it. I didn't write that. The publishers wrote that. And it's great that they wrote that. That's fine. But I, I do feel like, I mean, the definitive work on Parker's life and music is his music. So, you know, I think it speaks for itself and he's, he's written so much himself. And I, I guess what I'm hoping is that this would not be the only book. This will hopefully be just the, maybe the first of a bunch of books that'll be written. And I, I, William and I were talking about this in, in one of our other uh, events recently. And I, you know, I feel like we need so much more. We need an engaged scholarship on all sorts of aspects of the music. Um, I mean, I could make a list of several hundred musicians that should be written about. And, you know, I, I think we're, I feel like we're just barely getting going with the amount that's been written about so much of this stuff. So I just wanted to say that too. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but this is a real blessing just because, um, William, you, you are, are like a whole library. <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, the fullness of the legacy that you offer to us, which will, you know, which will remain with us, you know, for generations and, and what you've created, you know, what has come through you uh, is, is the resilience of, um, of Black cultural life in this country, you know, that is timeless, you know, it, it has aspects of ancient to future. So uh, really thankful for that. Now, because this is University of Pittsburgh, so it's a school, a school, one of those uh, scholastic interviews. One thing that was really fascinating in the book is that, uh, William, you have this, um, blueprint for a music school that I thought was really cool in here. Uh, and it was, this is something that was inspired by your early experiences. You said learning at the jazz mobile. Some people might not even know what the jazz mobile is. So we want to hear about that, but I just want to like read just a few of the things from that study one open improvisation without any verbal communication. Uh, preset improvisation, improvising with verbal communication, drones and echoes, pr practice of one sound playing continuously, secondary sound that is bounced back into the face of the first sound, then looking at the vibration of a sound, then looking at compositional possibilities. What is a composition for a hundred different musicians? What is harmony in infinite parts, melody, resolved, unresolved, partials, phrases, groupings, clusters, and then intonation. What is intonation? Non-Western intonation, in tune, out of tune, ear training, listening in real time, learning to respond to sound in present time. All of this is really wonderful. And, and it just shows how, I mean, people have this formalized idea of how you're supposed to learn music, but then, like you said, if you take the practice of going within and allowing this these new ideas to come forth, uh, this is this is one of the beautiful things that you've expressed. And if you could share how like what is your experience been? How do you, how do you, People look at you as a mentor, but I know Fred Anderson, he always said, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a teacher, but we have the school of Fred Anderson and I'm one of the pupils, you know what I'm saying? So, so um, how, do you, how do you embrace that, that role as a, of a mentor and, and just like maybe share a few I, thoughts about um, this, concept that you that I read that you have in the book? Well, there um, one of the concepts is what one would call self sound. It's a it's a phrase that I actually got from the poet Ted Jones, because he used to come in and, and listen to us play. And uh, he used the term self sound. And uh, that is your own sound. And then the idea is, okay, like someone transcribes a bunch of solos by 
John Coltrane in there. They become like a Coltrane addict. And they buy the same horn as John Coltrane. They there's a picture of John Coltrane getting a haircut. And behind the, the behind him are some books. So they, they write down those books. They look at that record four for Shep. They say, oh, Train was wearing that color jacket and those shoes. They do everything like Train does. And then they, and then they say, well, uh, can you help me? Uh, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, uh, I didn't learn every one of Train's solos backwards and forwards. And I got everything. I'm, I'm like a Train nut. I said, well, but I still can't play. What's the problem? <laughs> so I said, well, it's simple. You're not Train. We all have a different musical DNA. And if you take Train's blueprint, you're not going to find yourself. Along right. the way, you've got to figure out your own blueprint. And then the other thing is that we, we what I figured out is we come from musical clans. You have, uh, I've said this example several times, but you know, you have like, like you have a drummer and this guy plays loud all the time. And you're trying to say, why does this guy play so loud? I'm going to get him today. I'm going to wake him up at 3 in the morning. So you go over to his house, you wake him up at 3 in the morning, <laughs> and you say, we're going to play. Come on. He sits down to the drums, and he plays loud. <laughs> and what is wrong with you? And then he says, can you explain to me? He says, yes. Uh, my grandfather played loud. My grandmother played loud. All my uncles and aunts played loud. I come from the loud clan. <laughs> Now, if you want somebody to play soft, go over there and I'll, I'll take you to a guy that he don't play nothing but soft stuff. He's part of the soft clan. And then you say, well, there's a guy over there. He don't play nothing but melodies. You know, well, then he's part of the melodic clan. You know, so we all have our tendencies of what we like. You know, Johnny Hodges. Ah, oh, yes. But Charlie Parker, you know, that's another thing. You know, Fred always thought Charlie Parker was the was the answer to everything. I know. And he, and he, and he could be. But and, he couldn't be Charlie Parker. No, and then you say, well, Fred, I don't, you don't sound nothing like Charlie Parker. He says, you get it now, huh? <laughs> so, so, so there are all these things is that we all have our own destiny and journey. So you've got to figure out well, how you're supposed to be playing music. And that sometimes there's a reason why you, you, you do things the way you do it. And um, so uh, we all have to, you know, follow our paths and find out where we're supposed to be going and what we're supposed to be doing. And, and it, it all helps, you know. Um, and the, the greatest teachers are the people who, who just teach by living. You know, they never tell you, you know, like, like if you went to a... Um, uh, I was at, sitting down at a piano lesson that Cecil Taylor gave this guy once. And so the guy, he comes in, he says, well, Cecil, Cecil, I'm so happy to do this lesson with you. And so he says, Cecil, how would you do such and such chord? And then Cecil says to him, uh, how would you do it? And so he plays the chord and Cecil says, yeah, that's right. And, and uh, so everything, there was no information given out at all during this lesson. Cecil just said, everything the guy did, he says, that's beautiful. That's it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's not tell, you know, it's sort of just inspiring people to ignite their own confidence and, and burst of themselves and that it's all inside of us. We just need teachers just supposed to help bring it out, bring it out of them and have confidence that they can fly because they've got wings and we yes. and so you just kind of show people that they've got wings and and the bee they have confidence you know that you don't and that no matter what everything that duke ellington did he didn't do everything mm -hmm. you know you know he did you know whatever how great your your your, your heroes are they, miles davis didn't do everything there was a lot of stuff miles davis didn't do so there's room for you and 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 dizzy gillespie didn't play everything how could he <laughs> How could any one person do everything? So, but it makes like is that we've got to use these people, these icons, as templates for finding ourselves, and it just doesn't work. You know, at the Jazzmobile. Speaking of the Jazzmobile, you know, uh, when I, a Jazzmobile was a um, 
a school. This thing it still exists. It was an IS-201 up in Harlem, uh, 131st, 132nd Street and Park Avenue. And they had a Saturday uh, music uh, workshop with uh, started by Billy Taylor and uh, Dizzy Gillespie. And it was run by the bass player, Paul West. So you had uh, like the trumpet teachers were Lee Morgan, Joe Newman, Kenny Durham. That's where I met Kenny Durham. Uh, the trombone teachers were Curtis Fuller and Benny Powell. The saxophone teachers were Jimmy Heath, Frank Foster, um, Johnson, uh, the older guy. Um, I think his name is a minute. Uh, Lou Donaldson. Um, you had um, Sylvester Red. They call him Sonny Red. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he was up there, um, uh, Roland, Sir Roland Hanna, um, all in, in the bass teachers were Richard Davis, Milt Hinton, Art Davis. And, you know, I was able to study with all of them up there. And uh, they even had lit, um, Alan Shorter, Wayne Shorter's brother was up there from time to time. And it was very funny because you see, I'd come out to go to the bathroom and on one side of the hallway was Alan Shorter, and on the other side, holding up that wall was Lee Morgan, and they were walking parallel. And I said, aren't y'all supposed to be in class? And they would say, yes, we are in class. You want to join us? <laughs> so so it was like just very, very uh, hip place to be um, if you wanted to get, because you were playing the original charts by Oliver Nelson, by Dizzy Gillespie. Unfortunately, when I went up there, I was already drenched in the avant-garde. So, like Richard Davis would say, well, you know, come down. You said, unfortunately. Well, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) but then, you know, because I I would always be talking about, uh, I'd say to to Joe Newman, you know, about Albert Isle. He said, no, 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 Parker, not here, not here, not here. So, uh, so Richard Davis would always invite us down on Monday nights for the Thad Lewis Mel Jones. He said to come look at over his shoulder at the charts, and and I said, well, you know, maybe the Jazz Composers Orchestra or Sun Ra, but I didn't want to hear Mel Lewis Thad Jones. I wanted I, I wanted to go to the moon with the music, and <laughs> unfortunately, uh, all right, for, <laughs> unfortunately slash fortunately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was who I was, but 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 the bass players there were they were trying to play like Paul Chambers, so they they said, well, listen to this Paul Chambers solo, and play Paul Chambers solo. So I listened to it, and then after a couple of minutes, maybe a day or two, I said, not in this lifetime. There's no way I can play like Paul Chambers. There's no way. So then, and that was a great. A learning thing that well you can't play like Paul Chambers because you're not Paul Chambers, and that was <laughs> it. You know, so it, it it was a great it was a great place, and it's going back to Wobble Ware. You know, when I was studying with him privately, he would always I go to he's living on Eleventh Street between B and C, and I always go to his house, and he he pick up I'm truncating the story, but he would pick up the bass and he would play something on the bass, then he give me the bass. Now, if I played it like him, he says, no, no. wrong. <laughs> and then if I played it, he'd give me something else to play. And I play it, he said, no. And then he finally give it to me again, and he plays something, then I play it, and I play it my way, and he said, that's it? <laughs> Correct. He says, you two ever sound like your teacher. You know, that was his fault. If you sound like me, I failed. Mm. He said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the audience used to teach a lot, too, you know, and the audience would be real vocal. Yeah. And and they like <laughs> there would be musicians out there <laughs> hollering at. I remember having that experience. Well, uh, the bebop look. That's it. That's it. Come on. <laughs> yeah, the bebop look. Because I, I, I used to play with, you know, with Tommy Turrington and Gilly Coggins. And um, they would give you that. They would give you that bebop look, and the bebop look was something stronger than Superman's X-ray vision. I mean, they give you that look, and you like melt if you weren't strong enough. So it's like, what are you playing? If you've messed up the changes, this and that, 
and I seen you know all kinds of crazy stuff, man. It was it, it was fun though. It was fun. Yeah, we got a few questions from the audience. Um, this one connects literally with what you just said, William. It's what musical clan do you consider yourself a, to be a part of, and are there artists who travel between clans? Well, I, I I'm actually part of a couple of clans mm -hmm. because I can't get away from writing melodies. That's right. And I'm trying to get away from it and do some avant-garde stuff and some, I can't do it. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I, I just keep writing rhythm and melody all the time when I write. But when I play, I'm, I play to get to the Holy Ghost. Like That's Kid right. Jordan would say, yeah. so I'm I'm in those clans, but also I, I I seem to be able to to I mean I play with the European improvisers Derek Bailey, and um, it was you know it, it was I seem to be able to fit in with a lot of different people and still be myself, which uh, which I'm very lucky to do. Um, yeah, cause I play with you know with poets. I played with a ventriloquist this dancers. guy dancers yes a lot with dancers and the, you know the guy he was a black guy his name was lewis mcmillan he had a he had a white dummy and he would say this is the only integrated act in show business and so but he, you couldn't put, <laughs> you couldn't put the spotlight on his mouth because his mouth moved all the time and we used to play up at wall at wells waffle house up in harlem i so remember I, that guy you remember Louis McMillan? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He was, he was, he's, he never knew that I played the avant-garde when I was, after I left him, I'd go down to the village and play with Sonny Murray. He, he never knew that. And I never told him because I, I didn't want him to, uh, I never knew what he would say. Yeah. So I want to get to these questions right quick. There's only a few um, minutes left, but he, uh, this person says, what a grounded individual William Parker is, yet he can readily leave his this plane of existence and soar beyond the realms of the unknown. What is his spiritual foundation or source? Well, hmm. <laughs> you know, when I was young, I um, stud my, my had an aunt who was a Jehovah Witness and I studied with her for a while. In fact, when my aunt came over to the house, you never seen a family leave the house so quick. My father, shoo, 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 they all go out. And, and uh, but I was too polite to leave, so she would sit down and I'd do the lesson. I had nothing against it. And I even learned a lot from it. And then we went to a, to a um, what was that, a Methodist church. And then later on, I got, I studied the compassionate teachings of Buddha. And so I studied a lot of things, but I just got to the idea. The main message was that, um, you know, you love human beings, you love people, you try to get in tune with the universe and uh, you have reverence for life. And um, and that music was my calling. And that was part of that. So that was the main thing that I that I uh that I got from all of that. And I think it was very important. But, you know, but some people are like, I'm very lucky. I feel so blessed and lucky that uh, that I was able to be receptive to things. I mean, you know, uh, a lot, life is hard and very difficult for, for, for people. Very, you know, very hard. Wow. So this person says, um, how do you keep the inspiration going when it has been a year that we can't really make sounds together? Well, um, we've been doing some virtual things here in New York, the salons that we've been doing from Arts for Art. And you just you just find oh, there's so much undone work that's been put on the back burner because of one reason or another. Um, you... Um, there's lots of things to do. The the hardest thing would would be you know to, you know try to stay healthy and keep your spirits up, um, 
and uh, and just look for different ways is to stay on course. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's that's a challenge, but we you know we all do our best. And and what I do is just try to, you know, whenever I meet, like tonight, this will be an uplift for a couple of days. Yeah. You know, meeting you and talking and all that, that'll be an uplift for 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 a while. And and you do and, and this is one a week or two a week, or you get to play and communicate with people. You know, it's 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 good. You know. Yeah. So um, this this other person, and this will be the last question is, um, can you name two to three under documented musicians um, that young improvisers should seek out and, and look into further? And why these musicians? Where can we start? Are there recordings to find compositions? Well, well, I guess if they're undocumented, underdocumented, so they're probably going to be that many recordings. But you can do research and find out about uh, musicians. I mean, one of the uh, musicians who I met in the early 70s was uh, Raphael Donald Garrett, who was from Chicago. And, uh, you know, he came to New York and, and uh, him and Frank Lowe came over to my house and I, had, I lent him my bass. And we started talking about bamboo flutes and shakuhachis and things. And that's actually how I began playing bamboo flutes and shakuhachis after he did this session playing these instruments. And I found out that he was a very accomplished saxophone player. So we have a shakuhachi player in the audience who got excited when he said that. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> the shakuhachi, the hochiku, and, uh, and then, oh, overtone flutes from Slovenia. I mean, I really, really enjoy that. Uh, but- um, And then you play the Gimbri. And, yeah, the and... Gimbri, the Dusangoni, many, many things. But uh, Raphael Garrett is one musician. And then every musician is like under, you know, I mean, even like somebody like Frank Wright, the saxophone player who's very underrecorded, but his quartet was a classic with Alan Silver, Frank Wright, Muhammad Ali, and mm -hmm. Bobby Few uh, were, um, was it to me, the predecessors of uh, John, or the, they, it, they extended what John Coltrane was doing. And then the David S. Ware Quartet mm -hmm. was an extension of the Frank Wright and John Coltrane Quartet. So uh, I think you can just pick any musician. You know, I was talking to Great Shamanko the third the other day, and you know, I said, "Oh, so how come your your tunes are not in the in the fake book, the jazz fake book? You wrote a lot of hip tunes. Why is it always Wayne Shorter?" You know, so I said, "You try. We'll, we'll see if we can do something about that." Right. So uh, I mean, nothing against Wayne. I mean, everybody's got some hip tunes, but, you know, Gratian has some hip tunes, and there are a lot of hip tunes coming from the musicians on our end of the stick, except that we're kind of, you know, put to the side. So I would think, um, you know, Raphael Garrett, Gratian Moncourt III, uh, Dave Burrell, Bobby Few, these mm -hmm. musicians can be uh, investigated, yeah. Thanks, Cisco, for typing those in. For, oh, yeah. For Thank people. you, Cisco. Just, oh, but you wrote it to panelists. Can you put it to attendees? Or do you have that option? Oh, sure. Okay. So here's one last comment from someone. Juma Sultan has tapes of Lewis McMillian's radio show from the early 70s where he's doing an interview about Studio We. <laughs> So uh, that was a comment from. Yeah, uh, Lewis McMillan put out a newspaper every every couple of weeks. I used to have it was like the like the all about jazz, except forget what it was called. It was like 1973, 74. He put out that uh, newspaper and um, man, he, he was an interesting guy. He was d dapper and deb debonair. And uh, he introduced me to Walter Bishop Sr., Walter Bishop's father, who I used to play with Walter Bishop Sr. in the Hamptons. We do all of these 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 fabulous gigs. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing a fabulous gig every now and then, where <laughs> everyone is fabulous. But uh, <laughs> he had a little book of tunes. He only, all his tunes were in the key of C. And he was just a gentleman. 
He, wow. he always wore a suit and tie. And and you learn a lot from people. You know, I, I met Eddie Jones, the bass player from Count Basie. What a nice guy. And and, and they just and, and they just start talking to me. He never heard me play Eddie Jones. And we just start talking about the bass and the strings and this and that. And we became, you know, like a, wow, it's it's great, you know, meeting people and communicating with people. Yes. So with that, um, I want to end this segment. I want to thank you all so much for such a generous conversation that we've had. And I know the I know the attendees have really enjoyed this. And we're going to segue into the workshop masterclass, uh, William, that you're going to cook up for us. Uh, do you need a minute or two to? Yeah, just to, give me um, one minute. Yeah, okay, we can I, like uh, we can turn off your videos if you want. Yeah, um, I'll just stop for one minute. I, I, I talk. So now we're opening things up for the the second half. Uh, William has an offering for us for a workshop. We're very excited to have this opportunity so William we're we're free for whatever you'd like to do um, okay. <clears throat> you know I'm, I've been uh, talking we started this mentoring program here with young kids that uh, go to a junior high school and some of them in high school and um, I think that the most, well, and this is one of the limitations from uh, the internet is that, you know, we can't, we're not in the same room and we can't really um, feel each other that way. But um, how many people are, 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 whether you're a music student or not, okay, uh, the idea is to, one of the things that we all need is consistency, okay? And that is if you're going to be a writer or a painter or a musician or a uh, just being you, uh, you have to have consistency. Now, if we defined, I'll go back to that in a minute. If we define music, and this is coming from the, uh, let me see if I can go, can I grab that? I, I have so many books here, but coming from the, the, the Sufi uh, master, Hazrat Enid Khan, who uh, defines music as anything that is beautiful. And this is very important because, you know, most people say, well, music is you take two sounds and you put it together. But if we expand the idea of music as anything that's beautiful and that the music inside or in the garden what's in the garden growing is musical okay when the birds come around and look at the garden that's musical the little baby across the street laughing and crying and doing what it does is musical um if you're hungry and you go to grandma's house and grandma just took out your favorite pie or some whatever you eat, you know, salad, and you sit down and you eat that, you're eating that food is musical. If a homeless guy is on the street and he's hungry and you give him some food or help him out, that's music. It's it's really something that's life con confirming. And that's what we call swing. Swing is any life confirming gesture. <clears throat> So if you expand your definition of music to not just, and then, and then the last caption of that is music sometimes will manifest as sound. Okay. Um, now it said that logic is the lowest form of magic. Okay. Uh, what's truly magical is the most illogical. 
in the in the, in the realm of things. And so music uh, basically is you. The first thing the children learn in the workshop is, my name is Jose, I am music. My name is Mary, I am music. My name is Joseph, I am music. You know, my name is Robert, I am music. My name is Kwame, I am music. And the idea is to implant that Music isn't what you hear on the radio. I mean, that's one part of it, but also you are music and you can be part of music and uh, everything you do can be can be musical, okay? And, um, but if you say, okay, well, you wanna play music. I mean, I, I, I was lucky uh, because, you know, my father wanted me to, playing the Duke Ellington Orchestra. That was his dream. If you get the book, it's in the book. And, uh, but he never said, I want you to be a musician. I didn't find, realize that that's what he was doing until maybe 25 years after he passed away. He never said that to me. He just came home with a trumpet for me and a saxophone for my brother and said, y'all gonna play this. And we went to the music school. We think it was 75 cents or a dollar a lesson. And uh, and then after that, I got some mail. It was a place you can get mail order lessons, so I got a lesson in, in the in the mail every week. And uh, but it was a it was a foundation of like that's what I was hearing in my background, you know, uh, the music of Ellington, Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster. Now, uh, not everybody everybody doesn't grow up like that, but uh, from doing these interviews, I find that. You know, like Oliver Lake said, oh, well, you know, my uncle had a saxophone in the closet he wasn't using. And then I kept looking at it and I kept looking at it. And then finally he got sick of me looking at it. And he said, you want the saxophone? <laughs> and he said, yeah. You know, so everyone or the jazz club was down the block or uh, my mother and father uh, met at the Savoy Ballroom listening to jazz. So, so... I didn't have to yeah. be a musician. That's a romantic story. <laughs> but but uh but that's how it happened. And so um I I ended up doing that. But if you decide to be a musician, there there there's several things you have to know uh is consistency. Okay, that means whatever you do, you have to be consistent about it. Okay? Because I didn't know why music existed. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I didn't know how it was put together. And I slowly learned. But when I heard, you know, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, and he said, you know, I, I uh, want to play music to uplift the, uh, the world, basically is what he was saying. Um, then I said, okay, the reason for music is to uplift people, is to inspire and uplift people. And that was my, was my go-to kind of thing, um, in, um, in the world there, um, that now there was a reason to play it. And I went from listening to you know, MJQ, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, to listening to Ornette Coleman. And the reason I listened to Ornette Coleman, because at Hearn's department store in the Bronx, they were switching records from stereo to monaural. I mean, from monaural, which is one track, to stereo. So they were selling all the mono records for $1 or 99 cents. Oh, okay. And so they had all these Atlantic records. I didn't know what they sounded like, but the covers look hip. It was a visual. So then I bought this Ornette Coleman record. These, you know, they had this record. This is our music. And I said, these guys look weird. And they did. <laughs> I mean, I said, whoa, wait. So but you get it, you play it, and then you read the liner notes, and they start talking about The whole about, story, yeah. You get the story, and then who's Archie Shep? Who's this guy? Who's this guy? And you begin to put things together about um, what the music story is. And then you begin to listen to people. And, uh, and if you're lucky enough, you can actually 
put two and two together um, to figure out, well, well, why am I here and why does this music exist? And, uh, and I was just so lucky that everybody I met and, and the projects in the Bronx, they were a lot of musicians. And I eventually met, um, ran into Billy Bang, the violin player. Um, and, uh, and he was talking about Delmark records. Yes. And I said, man, would you get out of here with them Delmark records? But he, I said, no, it's not impulse, impulse, verb. And I said, no, no, Delmark, Delmark. So, so we began to check out the music coming from Chicago. And um, Song for Joseph Jarman. And, uh, and it had Fred Anderson was on that record. And then I read about a bass player, uh, Charles Clark, who, who died with a cerebral hemorrhage when he was 23 years old. He was coming back from a rehearsal. And so I said, okay, Charles Clark is on this too. So I check out Charles Clark. And it's, it's just a journey you begin to check out. Sometimes you go forward, then you go backwards. Forward. Like I hadn't listened to Thelonious Monk ever. And I didn't listen to Charlie Parker then because I was listening to Ornette Coleman and Cecil Taylor. I didn't listen to Thelonious Monk until way after I listened to Cecil Taylor. Wow. And, you know, because I didn't, I, you know, follow any lineage. I was interested in what, you know, what I thought was happening now. And uh, nobody mentioned Monk. But what was funny is that when we began writing music, me and my brother, we began writing compositions that were monkish. And we had never heard Monk. And we had real the real tapes of these compositions. I wish I could find it. The guy, piano player, Ronald Wright, White, who recorded it, he passed away. But um, but so I'm saying, wow, how could we, you know, there's a connection with music. There's a connection with people. And you don't have to really hear somebody. It's in consciousness. Like, yeah, yeah, it's in the consciousness. I mean, yeah. and then later on, you learn that no rhythm belongs to anybody and and um and no melodies and no harmonies and um and that every country you know and then when we heard the pygmy music the bonzilli pygmies um i wish i had my my links together but i don't have it for that but uh we heard that music and then checked them out and they didn't even have a name music wasn't even in their vocabulary they you just know, not, lived it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they fish, they hunt, and then it just went on and on. One thing led to another, to another, and um, I guess um, I was, and I did like dumb things when I was a kid. You know, I used to, I used to, uh, when I started playing the bass, I uh, think the first musician I ran into, one of the first was Charlie Hayden, and he told me to listen to records. He says he didn't go to music school, but he listened to records. And that's how, you know, he, he learned to have it helped him a lot. So I would listen to records I would play. I would run into situations where, I, where I'd get stuck and have to leave because I didn't know what I was doing. And then I'd learn, tr figure out what I was doing and come back to these situations. What do you mean? But it was just... Explain that. <laughs> okay. Getting stuck in situations. Yes. Well, okay. Like I... I got a bass from Bronin's Music for a hundred dollars, a Juzak right. bass. I took it out Webster Avenue, and I was waiting on the bus to go back home. And these, these guys come up to me and say, "Hey, you a bass player?" So I'm looking around, and saying, who, "Who are they talking to? <laughs> they talking to me?" So I, 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 this was before I met Charlie Hayden. So I, I got a. Uh, they said, "Yeah, man, come up to this place on Amsterdam Avenue. We're having a jam session." Uh, uh, you know, like. In a, in a week from now, so I wrote it down. They gave me the information, so I I, I played, you know, what's that with records? I mean, I had met Shelly, and I played with records. It was all kind of coming together. And I got to the jam session, and they were saying, "Yeah, uh, straight no chaser and F," and I didn't know F. I didn't know anything. <laughs> but I played, yeah. So I played. And they said, man, you got a good feel on that bass. Yeah, man, take a solo. So I took a solo. I did okay. I was moving along. Except 
I looked at my fingers and I had two big red bubbles of blood. Oh, no. I didn't have any chops. So I said, I got to get out of it. So that's the jam I got into. And I said, what time is it, man? I tried to act hip. Hey, man, what time is it? You know? <laughs> and they said, oh, man, it's, it's six o'clock. Man, you know something? I got something else to do. I got to get there to this other thing. <laughs> so I packed up and I went back home. And so things like that, you know, getting stuck with little things, not, not nothing big. It was all fun. But then I went and I, and I learned. I got, you know, and, and I got chops. And then I played with everybody I could play play with, you know, like all the time. And my parents were, I had, you know, were very nice. They didn't, you know, they let me practice all day long, all day long. And then, you know, except my mom didn't want me to go out at night to play, but but I got around that uh, without, you know, too much, too many problems. But uh, but it, it, it was great. And then and uh, I'm just giving you a quick recap, you know, how one gets to where it was going. And then I guess in 1975, I met Don Cherry. And uh, right. Right. And I was just sitting there writing my poetry and I hear this Deuce and Goni in back of me. So he says, you know, he stands up and he's playing the Deuce and Goni and I'm reading this poetry. And we do that for a couple of hours. And then he, then we walk up to the Chelsea Hotel where he was living. He starts talking about the Dalai Lama and Buddhism. And he's got some 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 rice cakes up there and some apple juice and all that. And so then he says, <laughs> well, what do you do? I said, I'm a bass player. And he says, well, come play at the five spot with me. So I, I, I'm i going in, you know, next week I'll be at the five spot. So I went to the five spot, which was on St. Mark's place. And uh, he was waiting for me. And he taught me some things, some the tunes. Although Don knew so many tunes, there's no way in the world he could teach you all the tunes. Because he knew, you know, we go from Stevie Wonder tunes to Monk tunes to Ornette Coleman tunes to his music to a Turkish tune to a South African tune. Wow. Dot, 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 dollar brand tune, Abdullah Ibrahim tune. So, but you learn quickly, you use your ear. And we had Ed Blackwell was playing drums. Um, Billy Higgins was playing drums sometimes. Wow. And Roger Blank, uh, Frank Lowe, Saline Fung was playing the chin. Hakeem Jami was there on tuba. And uh, yeah, tuba. Um uh, and uh Sandy Bull was on Oud. And we played for the whole week. And then later on I played with Don when I was working with Allen Ginsberg. We did uh Allen Ginsberg was playing a harmonium Don was playing the Trump piano and I played with Don again and I would see Don throughout the years, you know, all the time on the Lower East Side. And he was an inspirational guy. Um uh, and uh and that's the thing about the the Lower East Side at that time, you met with you met with everybody. You know, I, I would go outside to get a container of milk, and I'd come back in three hours because you go outside, <laughs> and here comes Jackie McLean, and here comes you know here comes Charles Tolliver, here comes this guy, and you don't even know these guys necessarily, but you just start and you start talking to you, and that was the great thing about talking to people is that, uh, like when I met John Gilmore and Marshall Allen, they they act like they knew me. They said you know like. Uh, what can we what can we learn from me what can they learn what can i teach them that's what they said i said what can I, you learn from john what can i teach john gilmore he said yeah you got the eye well take, tell me something you know so that all of these things were happening and uh when i met i was at this place called a firehouse once and i met uh i was there playing a duo with a little eight-year-old drummer and next thing i know i hear some other kind of drums it was billy higgins so I'm playing a duo with Billy Higgins and then Andrew Hill, who lived around the corner, he comes in. And so uh, I got invited to Billy Higgins' house and went out there at least three times a week. He was on St. Mark's in Brooklyn. And the first time I went out there, Clifford Jordan was there, Chris Anderson, the piano player, was there, and Wilbur Ware was there. And uh, so I didn't know Chris Anderson, you know, he was sitting there. I didn't know what was happening with him. I guess he was blind and he has this broken bone disease. But we went there and played. And uh, then we, other times I just played duos with Billy. But through Billy, I learned about the dance. 
between the bass and the drums mm. and then later on critical yeah what's interesting is that i had a record called o'neill's porch yes with Hami drake on it now that record was written for billy higgins ah. but i talked to billy and he was having his, a liver transplant at the time so I knew Hamid, I you know, met Hamid, and we had a great rapport from day one. So Hamid was on the record. So things happened in 1974. I met 73, I met Cecil Taylor, and I played with him in 1974 at Carnegie Hall. Right. And all of this stuff was on the was, was on the job training, whatever the initials, you know on the you know and that's what literally yeah. yeah literally it was on the job training um and um in 81 i joined the regular cecil taylor unit unit and, structures yeah well way before after unit structures yeah. uh and um at the time cecil we were rehearsing at verna gillis's place at soundscape and um Cecil was coming back from rehearsals with Ornette Coleman as they were doing duets. And so Cecil would come back and he'd say, you know, Ornette's complaining I'm not funky enough. And he's always complaining about Ornette. But then one day he came back and he said, yeah, he sat down at the piano and explained to me <laughs> what he was talking about. And then Cecil didn't say anything more about Ornette. He says, I get it now. Now, I don't know exactly what it was, but he said Ornette played some stuff on the piano and then he figured out what was going on with Ornette. And Ornette was another one in, in early 70s. You know, I met Ornette and um, he would, just the sweetest person you ever could meet. Yes. You know, always, you know, he, I mean, I remember me and, me and Patricia went up to Ornette's house at like three in the morning one day. He said, he said come on up, come on up. You know, because we he had had a videotape from the artist's house and he was just, he come and let us in the concerts for free. You know, so it was like really, really. Uh, community. Yeah, yeah, it was a community. And, and uh, you didn't have to, like, there was no YouTube. You had your own YouTube right there with, with, with living people. But everyone will follow a different way. You know, you might be living in Minnesota where you don't meet any musicians. So you, you know, you use what you have. But consistency, I would say and uh do uh, expand your idea of music if, you, if you're having after you because after you get out of music school you're on your own i mean you know like your teacher's not gonna be looking behind you to see what you're doing you know you were playing classical guitar now you're rocking out you, you know it's like that if you want to rock out rock out and i all mean all the way out, out. <laughs> i mean like six of the martial amps and turn them up all the way you know if that's what you hear if you want to be quiet and you can just get yourself a um, a jew's harp and just play that whatever you want to do you can do and 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 that's the the word but be consistent and practice and really become one with your instrument and um and have a um everyday a, a, a routine now if you're right what is what is what does your day look like for you when you're in the process of creating what is what does your day look like well okay we just take it from this period you know when the when the pandemic started i think in march we did a big concert last year town hall we did the curtis mayfield project and uh right after that you know, they began to lock down the city. And for some reason, I studied the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, like really heavy. Mm. And I wrote all this music about the Holocaust. Wow. And I put it aside. And then the next period, I would just get up and I, I, I would grab my tuba and I started practicing my tuba. You know, which which I which I had played earlier, but now I'm trying I'm getting trying to get back into it, and and I had like in the morning just just uh, and then I started writing a whole bunch of scholarly articles. I got invitations to write 
these articles, one about patriotism, one about this, one about that. So I, I would spend a period of time of writing. And then I started painting. Because I had started visual painting last year in Vermont. And then I started doing bigger paintings uh, this year during the pandemic. Now, when things got better, I stopped. And I mean better, I mean, when, as soon as they came out with the vaccine, I stopped the visual art and things shifted again. So now I'm just trying to finish up loose projects. And then a lot of people died along the way. Yes. You know, you know, Henry Grimes, Giuseppe Logan. Milford. Milford Graves, Toshinori Kondo, Sonny Simmons just died. Yes. Passed away and probably others. So that was always a little setback, um, you know, for me, because, um, you know, the year before that, or two years before that, you know, Blewett died. And I was sort of, uh, again, you know, hang out with Blewett every single day, practically, you know, he was in a nursing home. Mm. And so I was taking him to his acupuncture and doing this and doing that. And, uh, you know, he, and he passed away in St. Louis. So it's always a little sad, but, um, you know, one of the things you learn is that, okay, if someone dies, you're not supposed to die with them, but you're supposed to carry on the spirit of what, you know, of, of creativity. So um, then I, I, I suppose in, um, I started working with my, the first, uh, Chicago guy I work with outside of Joseph Jarman, who I recorded with in 1973 on with ESP Records with uh, Frank Lowe. So I worked with Joseph Jarman, then I worked with Jerome Cooper. We yeah. did a record with Cal Perusha and Jason Wong. And uh, then I started working with Roscoe Mitchell mm -hmm. and a thing, something called The Note Factory. Yes. And we did something on Blue Note. This dance is for Steve McCall. And we did a record on ECM with George Lewis. And then also during the time I played with Cecil, I met Wadada, Leo Smith, who played with Cecil. And we did a couple of gigs together. That's kind of where I met him. And um, then later on, I worked, I did a play with Henry Threadgill doing his music at the public theater. And I did, um, I did went to Europe with Moo Hall, Richard Abrams in a quartet situation. Uh, not saying I was invited back to all these situations, but I played. I, I feel you. <laughs> I did it, but you know the thing, yeah. But so anyway, I worked with Moo Hall, but then also I would travel to uh, Chicago, the Velvet Lounge, and you know, and Fred Anderson and Hamid and Kid. Yeah, did you all did that we every year for a while, right? The After Fest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we did the After Fest, but we also went to to uh, different places up in the uh, the Penafin Festival up in San, San Francisco, Ukiya. So we did we did different things, and that was always a a pleasure because every time I'd get to Chicago. Fred and and I'm just telling this because everybody I wish you could have all met Fred Fred yes. but Fred would be at the Velvet practicing and I I I check into the hotel and I come over, and the first thing he say to me William William what you got for me what you got for me, and what he meant by what kind of story I was going to tell him about New York and about the musicians because I, I I'm like known as a storyteller yes everything so I always had a story about you know like how Cal Perusha had used the same reed for two years <laughs> because, because he didn't have any teeth and he didn't bite down on the reed. So he used the same, you know, <laughs> and, you know, so he would always get a kick out of this and that. And we started talking about people. And then, then, then we go to, to Fritzy's or I'd go next door to Fritzy's that place. Oh yeah. I remember Fritzy's. That, that, yeah. that, 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 that place, which wasn't in the, that was in the old, Velvet, the new velvet. Yes, wasn't 21, there. 28 and a half. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Fritzy's had this, uh, this perch. And, uh, so one, so one, one time I was playing at the, at the velvet with Hamid and this saxophone player from Norway, Frodo. 
And we played. So I went to Fritzy's and bought this perch dinner, and I put it in the car, and then we went and played the gig. And we got back to the car, and we opened the door, and they said, uh-oh, something died. What is that? What is that? Something died in the car. And it was that perch dinner. I said, oh, Fritzy's has done it again. <laughs> It's, you know, the one rule is that when you buy it, you got to eat it. Eat it right like, now. Within, within within sixty minutes, or something else will happen. I said, "Well, what about my stomach?" But anyway, we was just having laughs and fun, and that's the other thing about being a musician. You know, you you get to have a lot of fun, and if you get on the road and and travel and play adventures, yeah. adventures, you know, that's just here in America. You go to Europe, it's a it's a, it's a whole nother thing. So, uh, but every day you're learning something about something and, uh, and hopefully you, you go into it and say, well, you know, I don't really want to play music anymore. That's okay. You know, but I want to, but you have to be you. You can't say, I don't want to, I can't, I, I can't not be, me. you know, you, you, you're stuck being you. So whatever you are, whatever you do, you know, you have to find the light or the way you're going to be doing what you're doing. Because the thing about Don Cherry, going back to him, you know, we'd just be sitting on the stoop with Dennis Charles or whatever, talking, and Don would come roller skating down 7th Street or 9th Street with a propeller hat. And he would, you know, and come by and just start talking. And automatically, just just seeing Don, you start smiling. You start uplifting. Wow. Because, you know, because he was a bright person. So that that's a gift. If you can just be a bright person in this world, when people see you, you cheer them up. You know, wow. and that's and beautiful. Yeah, and that's what you want in your music. But the other thing, if you if you're an instrumentalist, tone. Yes. You have to have because your tone is your voice. Right. And if you if you know if you if you're not feeling well, and the doctor comes in, and the doctor has a melodious, beautiful tone. You automatically feel a little better when he says, "How you doing, William? We're going to make you better." You know, if he comes in there, "How you doing, William?" Wah, 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 wah. No, you don't want to be here. You know, you got to have so your instrument is, is your voice, and, your <laughs> and 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 you know, and whatever timbre it is, and you see, you want to like, uh, you know, work on your tone, long tones on any instrument is important, and uh, every day have a routine. You know, find and find. Um, you expand your routine as you go along. And then you begin to see, you know, after a while, you begin to see how you hear. We talk about clans and you say, well, you know, uh, sorry, I just hear this. I hear this. I'm trying to learn this, but I hear this, you know. Yes. And they always don't never do that. You know, in, in junior high school, there was a guy named Manny. And Manny would always sit at the desk going like this, you know. Playing the drums. <laughs> yeah. And then the teacher said, oh, Manny's stupid. Manny's stupid. He don't want to do the work. They never said, hey, Manny, you want to take a music class? They never offered him a music class. We had a guy named Rafael Vega who used to sit in the back, and he would draw. He'd look out the window and be drawing the buildings and the trees. he said, oh, Rafael is stupid. He doesn't want to learn anything. You know, offer him an art class. Exchange, hey, Rafael, if you learn a little math, I'll get you in the art class. You know, you, as a teacher, you have to use your noggin exactly. and figure right. out, especially when kids are young, because you don't want to lose one of them. You want to inspire every one of them, so you have to figure out what they need, figure out, you know, how come this kid is coming late to class all the time? What's his problem? And then you find out that the reason he's coming late, because he's got two other brothers and sisters he's got to take to that school and then to another school before he gets here. So you can, you know, you got to break rules a little bit and, and, and wheel and deal. And talk. To, yeah. To, and talk communicate. To, yeah. yeah, because sometimes a broken, uh, somebody that breaks a rule for you and helps you, you can save their life. That's right. It's so important. That's so true. And it's like so. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, you know, I, I was just lucky to run into the right people. Yes. And then it just goes on and on and on. You meet, you know, wonderful. The momentum people. that just keeps going. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but I think everybody has that. It's just different for everybody because it can't be the same for everybody. Right. You know, I mean, and nowadays, you, you in the Lower East Side, there's no musicians living here. So mm -hmm. I could go outside and stand on that corner 
for a week. <laughs> and I will run. Ain't that something? I wow. won't run into one musician. You know, it's like, wow. You know, because, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's not like it was because everybody moved to Brooklyn, then they moved to New Jersey, then they moved here and there. And so there's nobody around. It's, wow. So you feel alone, but then you say, we have to carry on. You know, we wow. don't. You don't want to go to the jazz reservation, they call it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing. You really illuminated a whole visual and of of New York and and the magic of New York with this music. And and there's actually another question from the audience. Oh, okay, great. They they said um, you often refer to nature, but I'm. Curious to know how you reconcile this connection in nature with living in the city in the middle of noise pollution. <laughs> Do you sometimes feel like you have to fight to find a certain degree of silence? Or is there a way that you find space for your sound making? Well, I am a city person. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I have this thing about trees and the country and flowers. And somehow they're inside of me, mm -hmm. some kind of way. And when I get to the country, you know, I mean, I'll be looking like make sure there's no bears or what's something coming behind me. I'm not I'm 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 like not like a natural farmer or not like a natural adventurer, but I understand, you know, when I was living in the Bronx, what I would look at is the skies. You know, I have a conversation called the skies of the Bronx, is they had big skies, and those skies were a lifeline. You know, you sort of have to find your way to your lifeline. I mean, there's a there's a, a composition I have called "Sky Is Always Beautiful," and mm -hmm. and that came about. I was thought about soldiers at war, and they're just like on the battlefield, and they, they rest for a minute, and they look up, and all of this craziness is going, and they look at the sky, and it's beautiful. You know, it's always beautiful. Or or the the, the people in the slave ships where they, they, they maybe they, they look out of a a shutter and they see some sunlight or sky and that's like wow that's like you know a lifeline so you, you kind of find it uh yeah you find it beautiful someone in the audience is asking about the loft scene i know that that was a big part of your beginnings um I'm trying to get clarity on what they want to know <laughs> about it uh maybe what area or what part of the laugh scene that you were really active yeah well yes uh, i know you were part of the laugh scene but yeah i the laugh scene you know and i guess in 1972 they had the uh new york there, there was a place called Studio We, which was a, a building owned by the, originally owned by the uh, piano player, Burton Green. And he gave it to James Du Bois and Ali Abui, Juma Sultan. And it became Studio We, community music place, where they had recording, workshops, concerts there. Meanwhile, at 24 Barn Street was Studio Rivby run by Sam Rivers and B Rivers. Wow. And, and yeah. the building was owned by Robert De Niro's uh, father. And so they <laughs> rented the basement to, to Sam and you had Studio Ribby. Up the block from Studio Ribby, you had the Ladies Fort, which was run by uh, singer Jolie Wilson. So that was Barn Street on 2nd Avenue. You had the Sunrise Studio upstairs run by Mike Mahaffey. Uh, and there were lots of little places popping up because you could rent a storefront for 200 a month. You see, and if you had a storefront, you had a loft. There was Inverone, which was uh, part of a larger loft owned by the Brubeck brothers. Um, and that was run by John Shape, I'm not uh, John Fisher. And there was music at, at uh, that was on Broadway, 477 Broadway, maybe. Um, and uh, that was run by um, by John Fisher. And they had music. They, all the guys from Chicago 
and L.A. and St. Louis played there. We even 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 the New York musicians got to play there, wow. and uh, so there was places like that. There were little places owned by a uh, place on Varick. There was a studio five owned by a drummer. There were all kinds of uh, uh, places to play because. Uh, you know, it was $2 to get in a concert and people came and they wanted to establish the music. There was the Tin Palace and the Tin Palace led to the public theater, which was run by Joseph Papp. And that was a little more formal that had a guarantee. And then maybe from the, from the Tin, from the Tin Palace to the public theater, you might go to Europe from there. And then musicians were going to Holland and recording for like red records and things like that and uh record companies but new york was happening then there was so much music so many places to play there was on the other side there was studio henry uh which was run by uh, wayne harvitz mark miller and uh roulette was 2228 west broadway and fortunately, and this is a fortunately, not an unfortunately, <laughs> I was um, played at all the places. I was connected with all the places. The place I played at the least was the Ten Palace, uh, and probably the Public Theater. But I played there with, eventually with Cecil Taylor, and I played there with Jamil Moondock. Uh, the Five Spot had reopened, so you played the Five Spot. So there were a lot of clubs in the Lower East Side. There was a New Yorican Village. There was a New Yorican Cafe. There was the East Village Inn. All of these places. There was a place called the Jazz Boat mm. which was, uh, on Avenue A. And that was very uh, controversial. You know, uh, Frank Foster was over there. And, uh, you know, one night he, he, he was at the door and he says, and I was walk, got in there with, with uh, Jerome Cooper and Frank Lowe. And uh, he said, no avant-garde is on, on the scene tonight. So he, you know, there was a little, you know, straight ahead avant-garde motion. But then Sonny Murray came in and there was a big entanglement, which you'd have to the, read the Jazz Babylon, which is the book about all of this X-rated stuff, uh, which I'll put out in the future. Can't wait for that. I got another question. This yeah. one um, says uh, a lot of these musicians you're talking about are almost all men. Does William have any thoughts about why that is and why women instrumentalists were not a big part of the community? And maybe you could share some of the women musicians or artists that you've collaborated with. Yeah. Well, the first musician I worked with was Maxine. One of the first was a singer, Maxine Sullivan. She did, you take the high road and I'll take the low road. She was making a comeback. So I worked with her. I worked with the singer, uh, Jean Lee, quite a bit. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with the Gun Gunter Hampel big band and also Jean Lee doing her own gigs. Uh, I worked a lot with... Uh, the dancer Patricia Nicholson. Of course. I worked also <laughs> with, with uh, singers Ellen Christie, and we had a band, which was three singers, female singers, and rhythm section and Patricia, which she actually started the band. And so I worked with them. I uh, worked with Karen Borka, the bassoon player, who was uh, playing with Cecil and hooked up with Jimmy Lyons. They were there were a couple. And uh, but mostly at that time, uh, they just weren't. It was the next step generation where you had jazz instrumentalists. I mean, the only bass player was I can think of at that time was was Juice Juicy, which was June Siegel, and uh, and Kim Clark, who played electric bass, were coming around uh, as far as uh, female drummers. Uh, then Joel came onto the scene eventually, right? Yeah, well, Joel from Europe, and then there was a whole flock of them. Susie Barr, who first worked with with me in the Little Huey Orchestra in 1994, but that's like almost 20 years after the law of scene. So they weren't right. that many, but there were like, uh, you know, Jane Robertson, the cello player, 
Becky Friend, the flute player, was around at the time. Sharon Robinson, the French horn player. So there were a few, but now I'm you know, happy to say there are a lot of women who uh, play all instruments and lead bands. And, uh, you know, of course, back then there was Carla Blay, who was one of the, uh, you know, foremost composers yeah. at the time. And you, ha and you had Amina, Claudia Myers. Right. And she, she, did she, but she was living in Chicago still. I don't know when she came to New York, but she, you, we had her, yeah. I think yeah. in the 70s, maybe. Yeah. Or the late and, 70s, uh, early 80s, yeah. Uh, a vocalist Sherry Scott from Chicago, mm -hmm. who worked with Joseph Jarman, and uh, Sheila Jordan, of course, was always around, and she's like in her nineties now, and she's still around singing. So, um, but now I have to say it's 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 much better. It's much better. Yeah, it's a, definitely been a process. Okay, I had a question for you about Pittsburgh. Can you share any experiences you've had playing in Pittsburgh or? Well, I played in Pittsburgh with Peter Bratzman and the saxophone player and Greg Bendy. And I guess we did that in the 90s. We went on the first, one of the first sort of road tours, driving in a station wagon. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And was a guy named I... Manny Thiner. I yes, know. I know. You know, no, Manny. you know Manny? Yes. Well, he was around <laughs> then. And he was one of the first... Uh, Presenters? Uh, yes, he was the, the George Ween of Pittsburgh. Okay. He would hate me. He, uh, he, would, he would hate me saying that. I didn't, if you're listening, Manny, didn't mean anything. <laughs> oh, oh, you all know Manny? Okay. Manny's the man. And he, he always brought a lot of musicians down. He brought us to Carnegie Mellon. You know, he really did. You know, he, he, was, he loved the music. And so I, he's so that, still around yeah. I, I ran into him yeah he's like you remember me i was like yes i remember driving from chicago yeah yeah so man because those kind of people like manny are important because america's is underdeveloped the touring system and all you need is one person in a town that will be a hub where you can bring people yes uh, Anderson, Indiana had a guy named Nick Oler who, who used to bring people to Anderson. I was doing a, a tour with piano player Matthew Ship. Yes. And, and, and we, uh, it was a knitting factory tour. So we pulled into to Anderson, Indiana. And the thing is that we drove past it at least three times before we get, it was so small. And then when we got there, <laughs> we, uh, he put us in a motel that was a retreat for clairvoyant people. A retreat? Yeah. For clairvoyant. Retreat. They had rented the whole motel, but we got two rooms in this motel. And so we got to the motel. It sounds and like I, a movie. And, yeah, and I, I sat down, and then the, the lady would say, oh, I don't sit there. My aunt's sitting there already. And I, I, I didn't see nobody there. And she said, no, not my aunt's sitting there. I guarantee you. And I said, okay, so you get up. And so it was a little, it was interesting the gig. But then when we got to the gig, Anderson, Indiana, you know, he, he introduces us by saying now, because it was like, I was like, I was like a country and Western place. And he says, uh, now I want you to, you're going to introduce these two musicians. You're going to have one person banging on the piano and one person <laughs> going crazy on the bass. But I want you to give them a chance. Now just give them a chance. So we played, <laughs> and they loved it. You know, they loved it. You know, you used to On the piano. <laughs> yeah, the piano. <laughs> so they, they loved it. And uh, and uh, and Nick, he's probably still online. Nick Ola, he was, he was a really great guy. He, he brought a lot of musicians there to An Anderson, Indiana. And, uh, and but you got to be careful if you're doing a gig day, you drive right by it. <laughs> that small. It is. Well, William, this has been such a joy, and you've been so generous with us. Uh, I just want to, um, I don't know, uh, I guess it's a webinar, so you all can't join in to, like, all, like, show your faces, but um, they're there. <laughs> they're, they've been there, and we just want to thank you so much uh, for visiting with us at University of Pittsburgh tonight, and definitely stay in touch and um, 
Thank you. I just want to thank, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. This was very, very generous. Oh, we have we have Kevin McNeil. We have a few people from Canada here. Okay. Yeah, we got Marilyn Trudel. Yeah, Mar yeah, we got a few people um, from all over the place watching. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, I, I wish Michael I could. Michael Heller says hi. Hey, yeah. Mike Heller. Uh, uh, that is Mike teaching to you if where you, yes. where you teach? yeah okay. Yoko Suzuki and people are saying woohoo you know okay. lots of students um Tracy McMullen yeah a lot of people uh very happy so thank you so much great thank you oh somebody <laughs> says thanks from Hong Kong <laughs> I wonder who that is as, as, ben, that... ben Tan Ben Tan okay yeah uh, that, that and doesn't... somewhat Jeff Schwartz from LA. Oh, okay. okay. So great. You did good publicity. I guess the word got around. Yeah, just 